Yeah. Comfortable. If you sit here, it might be easier to see this screen. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you very much for joining us on Plain and Simple, a conversation with Genevieve Chua and Ruben Kihan. Today, they will delve into Genevieve's latest artistic explorations and technical experimentations at STPI Gallery and the evolution of her practice at large. So just a quick bit about Genevieve. Genevieve is a painter who works primarily through abstraction and is known for images of glitches, diagrams, and syntax, as well as the explorations into the two and a half dimensional space. Genevieve under Sorry about that. Genevieve undertook her residency at STPI in 2011 and returned in November 2019 for a new residency phase. Genevieve's last exhibition at STPI was twofold in 2020, which explored expanded ideas of painting. Our new exhibition, Granula, showcases a new body of work and is curated by Ruben Kihan, curator of contemporary Asian art at Kagoma. Last year, Ruben curated the first light of Genevieve's exploration at STPI titled Artificially Intelligent as part of the 10th Asia Pacific Tonali. And so we're very happy to have Ruben on board for this exhibition. It has been quite an exciting process with both Genevieve and Ruben in putting together this whole exhibition, and we hope you'll enjoy the conversation today. So I'll pass the time now to you both. Thanks, Siwa. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, as Sue said, my name is Ruben. I work at the Queensland Art Gallery and Gallery of Modern Art, where one of the things I do is uh, organize the Asian Pacific Triennial of Contemporary Art. And uh, it's in that capacity that I was able to start working with Genevieve, um, who had invited to, uh, to participate and who created a new body of work here at STPI. Uh, and this um, Exhibition really is, um, for me, a kind of an extension of that body of work, uh, and at the same time, departure into a whole new range of directions. Uh, one of the characteristics of our collaboration on APT was that it took place over Zoom. Uh, nobody could travel. Uh, ordinarily, we would have invited Genevieve to come do a side visit, 
do the, uh, you know, conduct the installation in this basement for very obvious reasons we weren't able to. And uh, so this has been a really nice experience to actually be able to come together and um, collaborate on something that's even bigger, uh, more spatial, take it uh, going in a lot of different, different directions, but uh, to try and tie it together. Um, so it's been a really nice experience for me to work with you, Genevieve, mm -hmm. this person. <laughs> Uh, now, the time we still plan to do with you is a little bit like those few conversations, just a lot of ideas being pitched around, um, uh, trying to tie some things together, um, and at the same time, allowing things to fire off elliptically. And then, in a way, I think it's um, the structure is going to be quite similar to uh, to these these beautiful type strats. Um, which has uh, has put behind us. There'll be links uh, and there'll be points of departure. Um, I hope that you feel free to uh, participate as well. We'd really like to invite conversation from the audience. In that sense, it's a little bit bigger than our normal Zoom conversations, but that's what it means to all be together in a space after a little while. Um, I should apologize in advance for the, the dad joke in the uh in the title we were sort of having a bit of a, a, a chat about it but um this idea of the plane um is quite fundamental to genevieve's work um as is this sort of this new idea of the volume which you start to see the projection of the work into space um this experimentation with sculpture that's taking place with all these other experiments that um that genevieve's working on and it's in this interaction that you get this sort of unique space uh, of the two and a half dimensions, which Genevieve has really made her own. Um, Genevieve, I want to start with the with the title of the exhibition because it's your idea, and it does come very much for your engagement with the workshop. Why granular? Um, well, as as you all know, like in the in the type tracks, there are like rows and strings of of letters. Um, that are really not meant to be legible, but if you do read them, uh, they are made up of fairly um, made up of sound letters, uh, mostly consonants. So, for example, a string of G, B, T, H, Z, um, that are letters that are not meant to form a word, but perhaps like form a, a particular texture or 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 a sound, and mainly that was what I was interested in, hmm. and. I think I was drawn to the word granular because when we were creating the cement sculptures in the workshop, um, what what we had a little bit of challenge with was uh, how how well do we mix the cement such that the texture may uh, seem more well like um, uh, well more well mixed or or do we go with something that um, would bring out the material if we try a, a more impasto style of uh, applying the cement. Um, yeah, I like what you said that our conversations may go off in like um, elliptically, which is, which is quite interesting. I've always thought that, yeah, our, our conversations go off like on a, a diagonal or obliquely, you know, um, which really um, activates the way the the process of making for me, uh, even as I collaborate with you uh, for APT or the STPI workshop, um, it always begins from uh, uh, with a question like if I'll pose with a question, uh, would you like it to go this way or that way, or how would you like it to look? I'd be like, let's try both. Um, let's go with a uh, more like. Uh, questionable option because for me then that it nourishes my practice and I can like leap off from there. You, you have this way of um, always seeming to take the less obvious route um, for something. Um, you've talked about uh, abstraction as um, a way of, of moving away from uh, the obvious, right? Yeah, yeah, moving away from the obvious, but also sometimes to be as precise as possible. Because like as I was mentioning yesterday in our, one of our previews, that uh, for 
for some people like to create abstraction is to be inexact but for me like i need to find exactly what it is um in a in a very in a in a way that is not figurative uh, it's like what roscoe said about silence that silence is the absolute truth um and and that is a very like precise statement to make about something that is not figurative I mean, it's interesting. So this, there is something in a, at risk of, of bringing up another dad joke um, and possibly in the, um, because your work is so tightly entwined with linguistics, we're probably going to keep making dad jokes, but there's a concreteness, I think, uh, to what you do. Uh, and so it's, it's not that much of a stretch that you, you, you move towards using you know, cement as a medium. Um, but that concreteness, I think, has to do with, uh, first of all, um, the fact that your works are insertions into the world, that um, they feel like they're part of the world. There's the scale is, I mean, it's it's a it's kind of domestic, except for when you're working on like huge commissions, like um, the one on uh, the and Sand at the moment, which is kind of going up. Uh, you either work like really small or really large, um, in a way. The, the, there's that kind of concreteness but there's also the inspiration for the works which comes from the world around you it's not like it's coming from some other place and uh so you know, we genevieve's really kindly put together this um this slideshow of uh images of some of the source material um for the patent system yeah some of these source materials are like uh things that took place during covid and um as much as COVID seems like a thing of the past, it was really like a pivotal point in my practice where I felt, well, I couldn't go into the studio, but let's just take a walk outside since, especially since there's nobody around, it's the perfect sort of environment to um, observe architecture without people in it, or in a sense, like observe altered spaces. Uh, so these are some of the altered spaces where uh, these pro prohibition tapes, these um to to tell people not to sit in areas that you know are, are for the usually for the community so in playgrounds focus centers uh sometimes even like just a flight of stairs but then for me it became like a drawing in space that i would take pictures of and sometimes try to uh complete the line drawing uh as you would see in the next few slides um and one of the other things was also like well I, let's for me, like maybe putting pen to paper or pencil to paper has seemed like quite direct and easy. And how do I disturb that process by introducing a uh, a device uh, like the etch a sketch, which is for me like really counterintuitive and very difficult um, to play with as a child and even as an adult. Um, and how do I make like very um, difficult drawings, like drawings that are that don't have a very like graceful curve or a straight line and uh, let's see what comes of that yeah that's quite interesting because you know um like i know that you do a lot of your designing on in adobe illustrator right um which is a, a place you can sort of play with lines and curves in a really uh precise and sort of high-tech fashion and as someone you know who enjoys or embraces precision perhaps as a sort of um as an aspect of abstraction i think it's kind of really interesting that um you move back into a space where you can make these really obvious errors like the edge of sketch yeah yeah and we also had a conversation about like um not just like for me adobe illustrator but for us like word processing yeah, yeah. applications like like microsoft word or microsoft not microsoft word uh 2020 too, but maybe Microsoft Word in the early 2000s yeah. where that little paper clip would try to yeah, tell yeah, you what yeah. to do. You know, the, these like very annoying interventions in the did, application. Did anybody like that paper clip at all? <laughs> would offer you suggestions that you do not want or that you will clip art man uh, telling you what to do. Uh, but these are the kinds of like um, things that I can rethink without getting annoyed anymore because it's no, it's no longer there. But also like uh, things in applications that slow us down or slow us down the process of making a, a, a very uh, sophisticated looking drawing. So I, I did in the beginning try to draw guillotine patterns, which are these intricate uh, patterns that you normally see on banknotes. 
Um, mm. After a while, they just seem very complete and symmetrical. And like, what am I trying to do? I'm not trying to design a banknote. So let's just like use these paths, these vector paths, and uh, replace them with text. You know, replace them with consonants and see what we get. Um, and of course, like I was um, really inspired by concrete poetry, but instead of you know stringing together a sentence, um, let's try to do that with with consonants, with sound words, with onomatopoeia. Yeah, yeah. We we sort of um, talked a bit about I guess the unintentional aesthetic of the high tech. Uh, the so you, there are like registers of those unintentional aesthetic manifestations from Microsoft Word, like all around the space. And behind us is a uh, wall painting that Jen put together. And this is the um, high, when you blocks of text when you highlight them in Word. Um, there are sort of flashing curses that are painted onto the wall or uh, individual uh, selected text boxes, which is sort of included here. And then the thing that I sort of found the most fun was the wavy lines, which you'll see that the red wavy lines for like uh, that were previously used for misspelling. I think you get dots now, right? Uh, in maybe a text edit. Right. Sure. Yeah. And then these um, grammatical errors are the the kind of blue green ones um, that you see there as well, and uh, sort of been played up a lot, I guess, in other aspects of the design. But there are um, some other kind of aesthetic products that you've worked with as well as um, uh, in dialogue with or as sort of ins um, inspiration for the work. So capture codes, right? Yeah. Um, so capture codes for me are also uh, very counterintuitive. Uh, capture codes are things you key in. They are prompts to prove that you are not a robot. So you try to read these texts or figure out the puzzle, uh, select the images uh, where, where there are bridges, and you're like really looking at them and thinking, am I really human or am I a robot? You know, and um, I, yeah, so again, it's a kind of process that slows you down and makes you like really frustrated. Um, so I actually have, uh, so I'm presently working on a commission with Sam to paint the full exterior of the building that they're currently in, in Tanjong Paga District Park. And on the building are, are various capture codes, you know, uh, that go re juxtapose really well with the, the humdrum of traffic that runs in front of the building, you know. So the title of the work is Prove You Are Human um, in the midst of, you know, going to work and coming away from work. Although I doubt that anyone would actually crane their necks to try and read it, and that would be really hazardous <laughs> anyway. Um, but yes, like, uh, there's actually a, a lot of poetry I find in creating a capture code. Um, I also did a commission with Facebook where I had words uh, just running across in, in, in ellipses or a curve. Um, and I find there's a certain sensuality to it. So I had words mm. like uh, clavicle, uh, nape, um, really like uh, words that refer back to the body. Um, and yeah, in a sense, to, or even a string of say a, a string of Z's, you know, that that um, sort of evokes a kind of buzzing sound. A string of R's, especially if you can speak Bahasa Indonesia very well. It's um, if you can do the rolling R really well, it adds throttle, you know, or a vibration effect. Yeah. Um, as you read it, there's, there's something bodily about that as well, because you know when I look at some of the 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 text that's in your works. I don't think much about what, what it sounds like, but actually what it would feel like to pronounce it. Um, and you know the, the the different points in your mouth that your breath hits when you're making the sound of a particular uh, consonant or even the sort of the vibration that you mentioned in the diaphragm as well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, like um, vibration in the diaphragm or what would be a good example? Maybe a string of M's. Maybe a string of M's actually like, if if you do utter it, it has a hum, a certain hum to it, yeah. And it, there are a lot of voiceless kind of letters like S, like hissing is actually voiceless. There's no like, um, it's not fricative. Yeah. Um. Or 
or maybe a string of Ds, you know, if you space them apart enough, it looks like something plodding along. <laughs> uh, so there's a kind of cartoonish effect to it, which I quite enjoy, you know. So what I do is like to type a chunk of text in text edit, which doesn't disturb you with the squiggly lines and then just like cut and paste it into a vector path and see what happens. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that, that's mainly my process in a nutshell. It's kind of, uh, it's interesting too when you sort of throw these things up because there's, there's not always like one strict pronunciation and those things will kind of differentiate regionally or in exactly. the dialect. Like, so like, when people laugh or die in, in a text message, it's five, 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 five because it's pronounced as ha, 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 ha. Or like, where, which country like laughs in K's because it's like, <laughs> yes, like a, a slight chuckle. Um, yeah, in Japan, it's what? What? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Um, the, actually, that text, because that text speech was something we talked about quite a bit as well. And, um, you know, when people, you know, take LOL, like laugh out loud, yeah. um, you know, which comes from these old um, news groups and, you know, IRC chat and then you know, became part of like SMS messaging and is now used in millions of different yes uh, and it's also verbalized by some gen z people yeah they say, they actually say well 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 with a straight face thing. yeah that's amazing but you know what i like is when you know when people sort of stretch these things out like yeah. uh lots of o's and l's and yeah when it's really hilarious like so hilarious you have to misspell it l l o l l l in uppercase yeah so but, but you know to, to sort of place that historically i think that's one of the first like uh, colloquialisms, collo colloquial languages, or colloquial kind of codes to actually produce be produced in purely written form. Yeah. So most vernacular speech is spoken, right? That's the, that's the kind of nature of it. But you've got a vernacular that's that's predominantly written, which I think is really kind of fantastic. Yeah. Um, or an interesting kind of product of our age. I think that's something about um, there's a contemporaneity to Genevieve's work. Um, it, it couldn't be produced at another time because of its points of departure are so new in a way. I mean, I don't know if you try and consciously do that. Um, well, I've been made conscious of it. So when I was at the Royal College, I had a tutor who said, when I look at your work, I feel like the clock is turning away from me. Um, <laughs> and he says, you know, we're not, we're not in, um, we're not in Paris when Stravinsky performed Rites of Passage, Rites of Rites of Spring, sorry, and the, like there was a riot, of course, because he had the orchestra perform sounds instead of music uh, to go with the ballet, and the police were called. Can you imagine, like people starting a protest because they deemed it not art? But as I watched my tutor seeing this, like, oh, he said, my formative years, uh, I didn't use technological tools. Um, and so I feel like whatever you're talking about is really far removed from, from the painting I know. And I sort of thought, oh, this is a one-man protest going on. It's not, it's not that bad. And I understand that it's not for everybody, but I do try to um, explain, I, at least since my edge control series, that um, the paintings for me, the flatness is important and the smoothness is important because what I'm trying to draw out is that the tactility of what is happening around us, you know, tactility of a smooth screen-based surface um, that only tells you when something's happening through like haptic feedback. Mm. Like that's that smoothness is really important to me. Yeah, that's I mean that's kind of interesting. That that subtle vibration in the fingertip that the screen produces. Yeah. Um, as a sort of new mode of sensory experience. Um, I mean, it's, I guess it sort of brings me back to the materiality of your work then. So let's flip it because this is what happens a lot in Genevieve's work is that there's this kind of, there's this oscillation to borrow a word from a, 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 a title of one of the works in the show, this oscillation between the kind of screen world and the material world uh, as if there's, well, there's a facility, a quite a, a sort of a seamless facility and sort of moving between the two spaces. But let's bring it back because ultimately what you do is you produce material objects, right? You're not producing images uh, in a sense. And that's, that's what we do when we sort of come to see an exhibition is actually um, appreciate these materialities. 
And there's something that the space does. Um, we played a bit with perspective and distance in installing this exhibition so that um, particularly with some of the uh, the pathways works and uh, a couple of these other cement reliefs, um, you can approach them from a long distance and they'll actually look like a sort of a classically modernist geometrical abstract oil on canvas. Uh, but as you approach them, they actually take on these, um, these depths and um, uh, planes and um, you know, slants and uh, these kind of these interesting angles. Well, they're, they're thrown into relief as you approach them. Yeah, what what I found when we were installing it, or what I learned was, they they can be like margins in the painting, uh, especially with the breeze blocks where the subject matter is more centralized. And then there's an additional margin when we frame the works. And then you know when we hang something sculptural, then we have to give it an extra safety margin. So mm -hmm. we felt like we were Around safety margins. Safety margins. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's one thing that can. Um, well, see, one of the things with physical space is that you can actually get hurt. I suppose you can get hurt on the internet as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to um, come back too to some of the um, most subtle works in the exhibition. And those are the ones that you're all going to have to crane your heads around to look at them. But um, the breeze blocks, uh, which are at the back, because because these are these two are sort of a product of of COVID, right? Yeah, part of COVID. As um, as we can see, is it's just the size of something. So what turned into my studio was the kitchen, the dining room, sometimes a uh, little study table, um, but mostly the kitchen. So it's just a lot of painting by the sink. Um, but what what is happening with the breeze box is. I was always trying to um, find an impossible portrayal of a space or an object where you don't know what's in front or what's behind. And it's something that I've always had fun with, even in my earlier series, like the ultrasound series, where I, I draw a square and it immediately becomes a window. Or when I, when I close up a shape, it immediately becomes an object or, or a space. But to try and unfold it to like really subtle tones, it confuses me as well, um, which is what I enjoy. Uh, and these these hanging here, are like maybe I think I'm probably at breeze block number forty two. So these are the more the more recent ones. Some of them have even become like shaped canvases. Um, and and it did lead on to a new series, which is hanging at the back. Um, there are three or four pieces with color and with contour lines in them. Um, and those, I gave them titles that refer to the shapes in themselves. So it's more leaning towards pure abstraction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's the, the, I guess it's probably a kind of related work of these sandpaper-like works, uh, which are prints, which have included here. So these, there's uh, roughly kind of two, two categories of work in the show, and there's stuff that's produced in your home or your studio, and then the stuff that's produced here with the workshop. But I think something that the breeze box have in common with these other works is this repetition of shapes or this kind of... Yeah, uh, with the cement screen prints, which are the almost like black on black prints, they were for me like things that I've drawings that I've always had on my laptop for years and years. And you know, they could have been bigger works or bigger ideas, but it was nice to finally try to resolve them into these small prints. And for me, they were puzzles. Um, I don't know if you've ever done puzzles where they give you shapes and and it's a puzzle of consequence. So if this and this gives you this, what's com what comes next? You know, and it's a very, uh, yeah, for me, it's a, it's a game of consequence. So in some of them, you, you might be able to pick the odd one out. Actually, I like that you described in the essay of these prints uh, resembling lozenges, the arrangement of lozenges, which was actually quite accurate. Yeah, this would, um, there's, a, there's this kind of interesting materiality to them too. And I think with all of your work as well is that 
there are these sort of sensory activations. I mentioned like seeing the text and imagining what it would feel like to speak it. Um, but uh, there's a lot of the work, uh, which is almost kind of classically sculptural in the sense that it evokes the sensation of touch from a distance. Um, that the materiality of the linen is kind of very clear. Um, that sandpaper type paper with this, then these kind of very smooth, smoothy inks, um, very dense blacks that uh, nevertheless are reflective of light and more reflective than the, um, the structure of the canvas around it. Canvas, paper. Um, moving between painting and printmaking. It's hard for me because Genevieve kind of quite seamlessly moves between these different um, media uh, as well. Um, but you know, when we were um, chatting, we were kind of talking about running your finger down the page. Yeah, actually, yeah, running your finger down um, paperbacks in a bookshop that have UV inks on them. Oh, I don't know if you've done that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, so um, there's more abrasion and then suddenly it glides and then there's abrasion again. Uh, yeah, it's something that I quite enjoy doing. Um, the workshop, uh, the printmakers in the workshop have a very clear understanding of what I need from them when I go down now because I'm always asking them to show me paper that doesn't look like paper or to produce paper that doesn't yeah, it doesn't evoke the word paper. So like show me something difficult. And they do have an actually like a secret back room <laughs> in the corner of the workshop where they have these, they have paper stock that have been um for me neglected, very sorely neglected because they're quite difficult to print on. Mm. Mm, yeah, although I don't necessarily want to print on them, for example, like the UV ink is very much an invisible kind of ink after it's cured. So like, for me, it's like, okay, there's no grain in this paper. Um, let's try to eliminate the grain or to mess it up mm. yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Um, then I, I guess the other, um, the other major um, component of the show is um, what I resisted in the essay calling sculpture. Um, because of your fidelity to the pictorial plane, and which I kind of described instead as um, volumetric works. But these uh, finally pushing all the way into space to a point where you're not engaging the wall anymore, not directly. Um, you may view the sculpture against the wall and it's sort of a relief. But what's supporting the sculpture is not the wall because so much of your work is wall supported. What's, the, what's supporting one of the sculptures, oscillating object at rest, is a plinth. And it's a plinth that's kind of necessitated by, uh, by the requirements of an exhibition space. Um, and uh, the other is um, supported by the beams, ultimately the kind of ceiling of the space and that it's a mobile. Uh, so there's a nice complementarity between the two of them, um, as well as an implied sense of movement um, in both works, one a, a passive movement of the mobile as it's sort of um, as it's influenced by uh, changes of air temperature around it, um, air conditioning breezes or the motion of people walking past it. Um, and the other, this this implied, I guess, heft um, that uh, that's so much a part of being a curved object, right? The fact that it can sort of swing. Yeah. As you were describing your essay, you called the volumetric objects curvy, curvy linear. Yeah. And then I thought, well, actually, they're all rectilinear if if you just unfold them. Depends how you look at them. Yeah, exactly. It's curvy linear, but it's two rectangles sitting on each other. And um, I was thinking, actually, everything in this space is a rectilinear. It's, it can be folded flat. Even the reliefs as they come away from the wall, um, it was my my maquette of the sculptures were cut out from a piece of paper, sometimes glued together, but sometimes just folded up a little bit. So it, um, yeah, it's interesting that you use the word volumetric. Um, actually, what I see also is circulation within the object. Yeah. That's quite important. Yeah. Um, because again, for me, it's a line drawing and it's not a, 
it looks like it has heft, but it's important to me that it remains quite light. Yeah. And we were talking also about the lightness of the con the concrete material yeah. because it seems like a very heavy architectural object. Yeah. But if we use a concrete planters yeah. uh, and we water the plant, it's actually a very porous and very soft material that changes color. Yeah. 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 It, it this it breathes in a way. Um, it can. I mean, it's. There's a lot of references, I suppose, to materials that are quite prominent in warmer environments um, that both cool and ventilate, like the word breeze blocks, for example, or the rawness of the architecture, which does remind me of tropical brutalism. I mean, I, I, I work in a subtropical brutalist building in, in Brisbane in Australia, uh, where the raw concrete um, has a delicacy and a lightness to it, but you know, physically cools the space as well. Uh, there's a there's a kind of a practicality to it. I mean, this architectural aspect of your work is really interesting, um, both in the reference to architectural materials, but this idea of circulation. We talked a bit earlier about like architecture as a kind of a um, as a practice of circulation. Yeah, and bodies moving through space. Yeah, or even without bodies, like how can a space be altered? for its various uses in past, present, and future. Um, I like when space is not, um, there's a lot of potential in the space and there hasn't been any walls, especially in a newly built house or building, you know, to be able to see um, the potentials of that space or to make walls movable, mm. uh, you know, it's something I try to do in drawings. So, I mean, you know, when you mentioned circulation, it, it, it kind of reminded me, actually it goes back to the capture codes and, you know, a robot creating an image that will determine whether you're a human or a robot. And kind of fascinates me that cyberspace is a space where humans and robots circulate together uh, to such a degree that they become indistinguishable. A certain point yeah it's like this this other form of architecture in a way actually i can plug um this talk that's happening next door at 4 30 which michael is moderating <laughs> it, it, uh, they're having a panel discussion about um ai or ai generated artworks um which can may or may not be an ethical issue um but yeah when you when you are not reminded of the ethical problems of AI generated art, you don't actually question whether it's art or not, at least for me. Um, but it, it's quite interesting because a lot of AI generated works, for example, have been trained on human works of human artists. And it's interesting what what kind of uh, pictures they can propagate from the human gesture. I mean, it's, it is actually kind of really interesting at this moment that this exhibition is on now and this is like the time uh, when um, you're having circulating on social media so much of this, um, this free, well, free for a limited period, um, uh, AI generated art. Um, and it's kind of interesting because, you know, when you made artificially intelligent, uh, which some images of here, quite by chance. Um, it, there was a, a kind of a consideration about you know, what kind of art does artificial intelligence produce? Um, you know, thinking about kind of computer cards being uh, underpinned by language. And um, then, but what we, what we sort of tend to see circulating on on social media is uh, it's all image based. It's all kind of figurative. Um, quite often, it's uh, what X movie would look like if Y person had directed it instead of the the actual director. And that sort of seems to be, you know, the way that people play with it. I suppose people might there might be uses for that sort of thing in storyboarding, um, etc. But have you seen much abstract AI art being produced? Not so much. I don't think it is as sensational as seeing, um, for, for example, AI-generated art of your 
future or potential offspring, um, you know. Um, well, what I'm interested in, which I will probably never know, I would never do that, but uh, Brian, who has a show next door, I think he may have fed um, these words, uh, for example, maybe the, the Lee family and sort of uh, the program is called Mid Journey. So yeah. What what you do is you feed it keywords and then it, it tries to uh, form a, a group portrait of a family or something like that. But some there are some glitches where you find uh, some of them as six or seven fingers coming out from each other because maybe they are holding hands and they they can't quite um, perhaps like portray this you know a very very di difficult hand gesture. Um, yeah, well, what I'm interested in is the glitches. I mean, there's the glitches. I mean, and that's that's something that comes up again and again in your practice. Uh, and it's it's where this kind of relatively smooth space uh, of cyberspace becomes bumpy and things go wrong. Yeah, if you expect something to be really efficient, but then it is it really efficient if it's slightly wrong or off kilter I, I yeah i think it also we were talking about processing like multitudes of data mm. and what that looks like so well yeah i mean the sculptures that you produced for artificially intelligent really based on the cooling systems um from computers that are processing huge amounts of data right yeah I was, I was quite interested because like i have two brothers and they were very interested in um uh building their own computers and one of the things that they got quite excited about was like the cooling the cooling system so you can have a gel system or a water-based cooling system and they of course they can't simply be stainless steel tubes they have to be lit up in blue and green um but it's just the aesthetics of that. It's always it always looks like intestinal, uh, which is which has always boggled my mind. Um, so they always look a certain way, like server systems, cooling Those systems. Are the, uh, the sculptures. Yeah. And of course, it's also like a, trying to break up the guillotine patterns and seeing the kinds of uh, seeing the dimensionality or. Um, the layering. There is a really kind of joyful optical illusion and with those guillotine patterns sort of overlaid and these that they look like there's actually a physical object sitting inside, like it's a maquette for some kind of utopian city. Yeah, they, it, it resonates differently from, say, a Bridget Riley, because I was thinking, you know, um, color field paintings resonate in this way, but I don't make paintings, I don't make color field paintings, but what can I do with uh, these very intricate lines. Well, let's talk about the almost invisibility uh, of your choices of inks um, and even of uh, the, the, uh, the color matrix here. I mean, these works behind us, these inks are almost not there, right? Yeah, it, it was one of the requirements because we were trying to emulate um, very early concrete poetry, which was done on a typewriter. Mm. And what gives that um, very, what's the word for it? Like uh, the tactility of it was yeah. that it was deeply etched into the paper. So we tried out various, like I call them shadow tones. So just the color of a shadow and to try to accentuate um, how hard the plates press into the paper. Um, and then you threw me the idea of creating a bunch of works for APT for low vision audiences. Yeah. And, and I thought, oh, we can send some of these plates over because what may not appear sensitive to me for the plates, especially since they were invisible, they would be actually quite, um, actually quite loud for someone who can't really view them. And I didn't make that really that choice to present the prints in an almost like br blind relief fashion as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like 
running one's finger over them like braille. Um, and uh, so this is this is part of a program, a number of programs that we run at um, in uh, alongside APT and 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 um, uh, throughout the, from our uh, outreach and accessibility team is working with um, working with people with dementia, uh, working with people um, uh, who you know prefer a low sensory environment, uh, and also we have low vision tours for. Um, for people uh, with low or, or no sight. And um, as part of that, sometimes our conservators are really nice and let, let people touch the artworks. Um, in some cases, uh, what we do is, is we, we ask the artists to, um, you know, to provide a little bit extra from their studio so that people can get a sense of what the texture of an object is. And, um, and Genevieve was really kind to send up a kind of range of plates and uh, and, and materials uh, for the, um, people to find, a, I guess, another point of access to the work. Yeah, a range of plates which we 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 have, we have tried, we have attempted in the workshop, but didn't quite um, translate very well into paper prints. They remained like very fun to play with. I mean, I did make impressions of these plates on my hand, so to just press them and then see what comes of it. Um, which was quite interesting. It's, um, it's really nice. Um, I realize that I haven't actually opened it up to the floor yet. So um, has anybody got um, any questions or anything they wanted to add, even interpretations or stuff like that from Jen? We do have a couple of roving mics, so feel free to contribute. Am I gonna have to single people out like a school teacher? All right. I might leave you for a little while. Oh, we've got a question at the back. Great. Yeah, so I actually made this, uh, well, at first, like Ruben did ask me, can you make some textual interventions in the space, like something to do with text? But, um, and I didn't know what to do until the very first day of installation. But at, concurrently, I was working with Alex Lam of STPI. He's the senior designer who's put together a really amazing catalog in the shop. And um, both of us had a really good time embracing what we call poor typography. So even in the wall text for the show, there, there are ragged edges, which usually graphic designers try to clean up uh, so that there are no uh, orphans and widows in a paragraph, yes. and stray pieces of text. We're having fun with these poetic terms. And, and you're right, like I did get a lot of like squiggly red or green lines as I was putting strings of text together for the type stripes. So it is really a reflection of my studio process. Uh, well, I was faced with, for example, like having to select huge uh, chunks of text, um, which resulted in these wall paintings uh, with ragged edges. Um, and also the, the what looks like paint swatches on walls are really like curses or the beginnings of a word waiting to be typed out uh, without the words in themselves. It also, when I, Painted this wall did resemble Human Chong's redacted text, which was hanging in that shop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I did tell him mine are not redacted, mine are selected. Selected. This can be cut and paste and reproduced. Um, yeah, I think that was, it was actually, it was really funny because uh, the wall painting had gone up and then we walked past the shop and we were like, oh, um, there's, there's Human Chong's works. But, um, but it does this kind of interesting thing in terms of the exhibition design as well, and that it sort of constructs this relationship in the space. We had we had talked early on about like actual architectural interventions, like we we're going to build tunnels, uh, you know, down these down these spaces, and we sort of talked about uh, types of furniture that could be made. But I think you know Jen arrived at a really elegant solution and breaking up the space with these blocks of color. And one of my favorite is actually the one in the, uh, the backspace over there, which creates a square uh, out of this very long 
uh, corridor, and it's a um, uh, quite a quite a simple but effective way of of creating a space of a particular kind of intimacy, and it gives you these great contrasts as well. Uh, the type tracks really pop against this wall, I think, um, and there's a there's a sort of a, a, a tonality to it that 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 speaks across the room to the breeze blocks, uh, and then you know it can be found within the um, the cement reliefs as well. So. Uh, it, it does, um, like the rug and the big Lebowski, sort of ties the room together in a nice way. Any other comments or questions? Um, so I guess um, something I, I suppose I wanted to ask is like, how as an artist is a more general kind of a question do you sort of hold these multiple directions multiple kind of bodies of work um in the air at the same time you kind of like work through the series over a number of years and start other series there are all these kind of different things going on at once actually i found that only because of the occasion of this panel discussion i had to map and retrace my steps uh from the last two years because in the beginning um which is hard because it all blurs together right yeah yeah but i don't burden myself with thinking that i have to do multiple things at the same time um just one thing at a time and then if i if you do ask me a question about the work that came two years ago mm. i do take some time to recall mm. why and how i got here from there um so it's something I don't want to burden myself with. Yeah. But, but do you find you have to do that in curating? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, yes, I think this is called multitasking in a yeah. way. I can't multitask. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, I guess you're sort of working on a number of projects at once. Oh, I don't know. What I like about your work is there is this kind of continuity. So even if there is di different directions or experimentation with different media, um, there seem to be, I don't know, cores of your practice that you can kind of go back to and, and elaborate a little further. It's like you said, it's intuitively set a system up that you can return to yeah. in a way. Yeah, well, one of the plot twists in the show is one work that's hanging in the back called Notes on Breathing. Yes. It's the only figurative work in the show. Yeah. Um, and it has, I, I have actually worked on it, it, various iterations of it over the past perhaps five years. Um, and this, this is what I've come up with. And it may or may not be the springboard for another body of work, but that's how it is for me. Yeah. I mean, it, it, that one's actually. That was super interesting when you sort of first presented it to me because um, yeah, that, that was the term that I used was plot twist. And that um, after all of this work with abstraction, what you call near abstraction, um, there's this, this is figurative work there. We positioned it in the show in a, in a way that it's um, potentially uh, the work that you might even encounter last as you're sort of moving through the space. But it does relate thematically uh, to this idea of oscillation. Um, that's sort of playing across the work. And, and, and you spoke in one of our chats about uh, breathing as a kind of oscillation in and out. Um, the rhythmic, rhythmicity, the rhythm may change, but uh, it, is this, um, it is this kind of constant you know, back and forth, this trade off of different gases that happens through the body. Yeah. Um, and it was positioned in a way um, you were quite clear on people encountering it side on as well, rather than head on. So this is a work that um, consists of two clear acrylic sheets, plates. Um, on the outside one, there's a sort of a matrix that, that forms into uh, that of a, of a human body. And then behind it, um, in the area, uh, behind the sternum, behind the chest, uh, is this sort of amorphous shape, which appear because of the title 
notes on breathing um, to be a set of lungs, but it's not a set of lungs, is it? Mm -hmm. you want, you, you so far, what? only one person got it. Um, yeah. For me, it's an open book, but I, I, I do not uh, mind if people see it as an organ. Yeah. Yeah. A slow encounter, I guess, was what we were going for when we were putting that work back. Uh, because it takes time to align the breath with the body. One of the, um, I mentioned rhythm before, rhythm is a pretty key aspect, I think particularly of the type tracks, um, but also of this idea of oscillation and the rhythm that's introduced by punctuation that um, is really quite fascinating. And it's something you've played with a bit. And there are three different possible spellings of the title of this exhibition, and they're all wrong. Uh, <laughs> but this insertion of like commas to drag the time out in a kind of a, a sensory sense. I did consider not even having a word, just a mishmash of symbols, but, um, or maybe just uh, something that looks like a cat sitting on a cat sat on your keyboard, and this is what happened. But it would have been a struggle for marketing the show. <laughs> um, I think it's it's pretty cool actually. Um, I mean, going back to okay, the cat sat on the keyboard, which is like an it's kind of a it is this funny manifestation of our. Um, our sort of current experience. Sometimes um, with predictive texts and, uh, and and predictive typing, cats can sit on the keyboards and actually come up with actual words exactly. um, that send to people. You know, um, I was really interested in kind of going back to like those those kind of SMS abbreviations to in uh, the earlier emojis. Um, so before we actually had a little function on our phone that that would create this wonderful range of emojis um, we'd had to type them out and it was this kind of really funny sort of um, figurative concrete poetry that that um, that everybody could engage in in um, and making little smiley faces or winks or um, spectacles or or what and I found that even the the spectrum of emojis now uh, I don't even have that emotional spectrum <laughs> It's true. It's a tough decision to make as to like which laugh I might be to choose, right? Yeah. Any emoji users here want to chip in? <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Come on. I think we've covered quite a lot. Maybe Please. that's why. But it take, does take time to percolate. So, could a microphone come in, please? Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, so I was wondering, the references at the, your starting point seem to be very contemporary. Um, the aesthetics, at least to me, they do have some relationship to minimalism or kind of early modernist movements. I wonder, like, how do you see this? Or do you bother even looking at these historical um, connections or not at all? I mean, I do borrow the one of the rules of minimalism, which is uh, that the sculpture that you're standing in front of is measured by your own body. This is how, that is how I created the work. Um, it's not something that I can ignore. Yeah. But, I mean, it's, it's interesting because I got a, a question yesterday, which was something that I'd ask you, particularly about the type tracks. And that was um, Duchamp's large glass, and in particular, this kind of sequence of intersecting cones, uh, which is sort of created on a flat plane, but have this, this kind of depth to them. But it wasn't something that you'd really considered. No. No. Um, yeah, so it's sort of coming together, but maybe there's some aspects of it. Yeah, inevitably, we have picked that up, picked that up, but not conscious, not consciously, not always conscious. I mean, more broadly, do you see your works in conversation with other, say, artists making work now? Are your peers? Perhaps the conversation that's happening next door. <laughs> Not sure. Didn't think that far. That's all right. Maybe that's my job. Yeah. 
Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> Him and Chang step up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, nice. Any other comments or questions for Jen? No? Um, well, unless you've got anything else you wanted to add, we might leave it there. Um, can I get a really big hand for Genevieve? This is a really mm -hmm. big hand. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you to both Jen and Ruben for the very, very interesting and insightful conversation. I think all of us enjoyed it very, very much. So um, just a few rundown of some of the programs that we're gonna have for the rest of this exhibition. If you're time for sorry, if you're in town for a little longer, we're actually going to have a curator's tour led by Ruben himself on the 21st of January, which you can register for on our website. Jen will also be leading a workshop on 11th February titled Passwords disruptions on type and reading, which I think will be quite exciting to attend. We'll also have several other public programs, including a film screening and a performance by Singaporean artist, Bonnie Heiko, which you can find out more about on our website. Finally, as mentioned by Jen during the talk, we have a very beautifully designed exhibition catalog, and it contains a curatorial essay by Ruben, which is available right now at our corner shop, just around this corner. So thank you once again to everyone for coming down here on this afternoon and have a lovely day ahead. Thank you.